joining us from the United States. And thank you for doing so. To talk about the revolutionary change to our lives and the future of it is Professor Michael Whitbrock, who's at Auckland University, but very kindly has consented to talk to us. I think you're in Cambridge or Massachusetts at the moment. Michael, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you, uh, Michael. Um, it's been a long time since I've seen you. I... Um, and no, I'm in Washington, D.C. today. <laughs> oh, Washington, D.C., love it, place. Uh, you know, when I saw you, Michael, and I thought, gosh, you've done well for a young whippersnapper from Otago University. They've made you a professor. <laughs> that must have been an interesting journey. It was a very long journey. Um, yeah, yeah. And congratulations. And, uh, a lot of it's been, uh, thank you. No, well thank done, you. mate. And, and congratulations on your um, complicated career, too, which <laughs> I've uh, <laughs> basically followed from afar. Yeah. Oh, you're very diplomatic. Just to explain to listeners, Michael and I were on the opposite side of the homosexual law reform bill, as I remember it. Yes, and Mike lost, as he has in many other um, debates. <laughs> um, actually, no, I had to take that view because that's how I managed to get it. If you remember rightly, we did a Sunday TV program that came out of Dunedin. I, 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 I don't remember that specifically, but it seems very plausible. Uh, yeah. I do remember you from Dunedin. Yes. Yeah. And that, you'll be delighted to know that I voted for gay marriage in Parliament. But didn't get I my, should think so. Well, didn't get my way. I mean, it was amazing. Yeah. Um, by the early 90s, I was going, well, for, for God's sake, you know, everybody should have a mother-in-law. Um, and um, yeah. uh, it took so long, in actual fact, after the homosexual law reform bill was passed to actually get all the other discrimination removed. Too long. Yeah, I was afraid. I was afraid that New Zealand wasn't going to beat the United States to it, and it uh, kind of did in the end, but mm. only just. No, it took a long time. Uh, yeah. No, um, no, yeah. that's not what I want to talk about today. You are. Uh, I've read your article in New Zealand Herald about, and I agree with you completely, about the social disruption and the economic and cultural disruption that will be caused by artificial intelligence, and I was making the. Um, analogy prior that the industrial revolution wasn't over in 20 years the technology revolution seems to be catching a pace not slowing down at all do you see artificial intelligence as being the exclamation point or yet, yet again just another way station on the road i think that it will be a very fundamental um change i don't think it's so I don't think it's the end, but it, um, you know, just as the Industrial Revolution um, changed our relationship to physical labour um, slowly and then very quickly and then more or less, uh, in some ways, um, more or less completely, I think that this um, artificial intelligence uh, sort of revolution, which has been some time uh, coming, will have a fundamental will fundamentally change our relationship to um, intellectual labour um, in a way that's going to going to change things dramatically. Before the, uh, you know, if we and if we get it right for the better, which is um, you know why I think that it's important for Aotearoa and New Zealand to be involved. Yes, um, I'm assuming though that I mean the chatbots is the issue that's come out now where. Apparently, chatbots can now write every essay that you and I laboured on as undergraduates and postgraduates when we're at university. What's the problem with that? Is the problem that we can't work out it's your own work, or is it the problem that chatbots can give a better answer than us? Um, for chatbots, neither of those, but um, and opinions greatly differ on this, right? Um, I think these these chatbots um, are kind of the first, um, the, you know, the first uh, result of kind of um, artificial intelligence research. Where um, you know, when someone, um, you know, when anyone really interacts with them, you know, no matter what language they speak or no matter what kind of background they have, um, they will sort of perceive them as being meaningfully intelligent in some form, right? Um, you know, maybe just uh, in the same way that, you know, a, um, you know, a dog or a, um, 
um, or a monkey, right? Um, something um, less than a chimpanzee even, is meaningfully intelligent, really meaningfully intelligent in a way um, that no machines have been before. Right? I think that's kind of the dramatic thing which is focusing everyone's attention on it. Now, that doesn't mean that they're about to you know, replace everything that humans uh, can do well, right? But it does mean that we are being, I think, invited to think about what's going to happen as these uh, systems become more and more competent. The issue is in some ways almost sentience, isn't it? When, do, when does artificial intelligence have a concept of itself so that it can activate itself without necessarily human input? Is that very far away? Um, I, 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 uh, that's a very complicated um, question. I mean, you know, ChatGPT, for example, will talk about itself. I don't think it has a sense of itself in the way that we do. I don't know that these systems need to have a sense of themselves in the way that we do. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know whether that's um, sort of important or um, useful, but um, I think you know, the, 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 the more pressing question is, you know, as the kind of things that we expected um, required a human to do, right, decrease um, in number, um, how are we going to react to that? And are we going to, um, as we've fairly much managed to do so far, are we going to um, use this? Uh, is humanity going to use this capability to make life um, sort of better, richer, more fulfilling um, than it's been before? Um, or are we going to, um, you know, are we going to um, view people as, keep on viewing people as something useful, which is now becoming um, useless, right? I think the key question here is can we change the way we think about people? Um, from thinking of them as resources, things to be used by other people or by other organizations, and start thinking about human beings more as being valuable in and of ourselves, right? Not as uh, something to be used. If we can make that change, right, which I think is going to be necessary, um, then AI will be the best thing that ever happened to us. Well, I assume, though, that all technological and industrial um, advancement from humankind has always had the yin and the yang about it, the good and the bad and the, or, you know, go blimey in between. I'm surmising right. that artificial intelligence, though, in the immediate future, will revolutionise, surely, teaching, um, not just at an academic level, but at a school level, in the sense that, as a student, I will have not simply a wealth of information available to me through chatbots and the like, but also information that answers my specific question um, that I won't necessarily have to research by going into books or pouring through Google or going on Wikipedia even, that I'll have the answer available to me. Is Well, well that, I think that's kind of true, but that's already been true for quite some time, right? Like every, you know, everything that anyone's ever written is kind of available to us now if we just know how to search for it. Yeah. That doesn't mean, um, you know, that doesn't mean that um, it's not useful for us to take that in, right? Uh, perhaps now in a, a much better digested way, in a way which understand, may, maybe understands what we already know, but in a, um, in an, uh, you know, to take that in, and make it useful to us. We're just having the answer doesn't mean that we can use the answer, right? So we still will need to educate ourselves to be functioning people in the world who are part of our civilization. But the I'm already getting. I'm, that, but people are already. A lot. Yeah, but people are already getting irritated though, Michael, with the idea that, um, for example, you can't reach a human being to talk about a particular issue. You are continually striking in anything from corporate to public agencies to public departments to local departments. You keep on striking um, a sort of automated system that... Try I completely agree. In fact, one of my hopes 
uh, in coming here to the United States is that I can actually walk into an American Express office and uh, stop being, um, you know, refused service from uh, alternating telephones and email addresses, right? So, so as I actually, um, this is one thing that these AI systems might do a lot better, right? You know, not not have a person, right? But actually have uh, something that can solve problems on the other side of those systems, something that actually care, you know, something that's actually paying attention to your problem and trying to solve it. This is something that, you know, this is something that AI, um, I think, promises quite quickly to start being able to do. Um, what about other things, though? Um, the other thing, that I, I have, a, for example, a family member who's involved in coding um, for uh, software. Um, I, yep. I raised with him that I thought that his job would be made redundant in the next five to ten years because there will be a machine that can do what he can do. And I would think that that relates to a lot of software that's being created at the moment. Am, am I right or am I wrong? Um, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure about that. Um, you know, so I um, weirdly uh, still try to um, program a little bit myself, and I've been using um, something like ChatGPT uh, for programming. And it's very helpful in sort of sketching out ideas and getting you to something you can test and run. Right, but it doesn't. Um, at the moment, these systems don't have a sort of strategic view. They give you tactics for making software, but they don't give you a strategy for how this thing should operate or um, for defining what problem it's going to solve and you know, broadly how it's going to solve it. So I think there will be certainly um, plenty of room for um, you know, software architects and software designers. Um, you know, um, you know, just as um, you know, um, you know, in the in the beginning, at least, um, uh, providing uh, having power drills, right, and power stores and so on, hasn't stopped people from being involved in designing uh, houses or building <coughs> houses. Now, of course, in the long term, you know, I I think that we these systems are going to become more and more capable, and um, you know, jobs, some parts of programming. Um, will eventually um, go away. And then in the very long term, I think that this idea of having jobs for humans will go away and we'll wonder why we ever let ourselves do that, right? Um, you know, why why do we let ourselves do something for that someone else tells us to do just because it's useful for them, right? So, if, you know, if we can manage this trans transition, we can... Um, do the things that we want to do. Well, right? uh, can, I, can I give you an analogy, yeah. Michael? Um, uh, we're talking about yeah. making cars, and humans used to right. do that in New Zealand. We had a burgeoning car industry for there for a wee while. Uh, now we know that yeah. uh, they're all made overseas and um, in good part by, by robotic means. Do you perceive yeah. AI removing jobs but um, and sort of those sort of assembly line jobs completely when it comes to construction of just about everything that they will eventually take over? They will have been, I think eventually they will remove the notion of human beings as something that should be useful as opposed to human beings as something which are, uh, uh, as things which are, or as, as people who are valuable. Right? I think that this idea that our purpose is to be useful to other people or to other organizations is a somewhat, um, it's, a, it's really a somewhat recent um, idea that this is sort of a, uni uh, a, a universal um, purpose for human beings, right? Um, and it's not, a, I think it's not a necessary idea. So I, I think the idea that you will um, have so a job that defines you um, eventually will uh, uh, will need to go away. Wow, that's a, I mean, that's a massive societal change you're talking about because we are defined to a good extent by the work that we do. Uh, it gives us not simply an income, right, but, but, but also but status. Be, right, but we could be desi um, defined by our avocation, right? The thing that we choose to do and that we um, make ourselves really... Um, good at. So my, my plan for the long-term future, and perhaps I shouldn't say this in public, is uh, to get really 
really super good at having conversations and making a particular kind of cocktail so that people will line up to come and have a chat with uh, you know, former Professor Whitrock and, uh, <laughs> yes. have, and um, drink the best sidecar on the planet. <laughs> well, I mean, that's the aim and an aspiration. I'm actually thinking, though, um, we already, the Industrial Revolution already created um, and certainly the economic revolution of which you would have been a part. You've you've lived through Rogernomics um, and its consequences. <laughs> We've already created a generation of people who have very little stake in our society. So they don't have the skills, they don't have the opportunities, they don't have the financial means um, to be, if you like, stakeholders in the, in the communities or the uh, societies in which we live. This morning, for example, I've been talking about the 126,000 people that um, um, are living in child poverty, according to our Ch children's commissioner in New Zealand. Um, so, therefore, I'm 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 anticipating that although there might be positive, beneficial aspects of AI for I don't know the middle class, upper middle class, don't those whose labour is still their source of income face some degree of danger from the future? I think. Um, everyone always faces some degree of danger from the future. And this really is um, a, a choice. Absolutely, the people who are currently most disengaged and most um, so vulnerable, right, um, for, or most sort of disconnected, um, if we don't focus on making the world um, better for the people who are being most disrupted and will be most affected if um, their lives are disrupted, then we're doing it wrong and we're not doing things in the New Zealand way. And one of the reasons I moved back home from the US was that I really thought um, Aotearoa New Zealand has a chance to get this right uh, in a way that other countries um, may not do. I think that you know one of the, one of the things that we think about ourselves is that we can solve um, or we can sort of fumble our way towards solutions to these difficult um, societal problems um, somehow before other people. And I think this is a real opportunity um, for, for us to work out, you know, how do we embrace this change in a way which really does um, allow for more fulfilling lives for the people whose lives have not been particularly fulfilling in the sort of society that has benefited you and me. Okay, now, well, and that, that brings me to the next point. Um, the government has, I think, sought, uh, Chris Farfoy did before he resigned from Parliament, um, has sought to get involved in international organisations to look at these sorts of issues. Is New Zealand a, a, fo is a, New Zealand a follower or is it trying to get on the train? when it comes to looking at the implications of AI for us as a country and for society in general? Uh, it's absolutely trying to get on the train and not just looking at the um, implications, right? Uh, try, uh, um, getting on the train in terms of being a contributor to the, to the development of these systems so that we can shape um, what kinds of systems they are and when. So I think, um, yes, we are, uh, as a country, we are... Um, Doing, um, yeah, doing quite a lot of work to try to get on board. Um, I think it would be very good if that was done in a more concentrated and more um, sort of multi-partisan um, sort of way, a more joined up sort of way. Um, I, because I think, um, you know, people disagree on this, but I think that, you know, the, at least the, the, the raising of AI in the public consciousness has made... Um, people made a response yeah. to it, or are yeah. beginning to have a response to it more, more urgent. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think that's right. Um, listen, the other thing is um, internationally, you would expect there is there a, an international agreement? I mean, are China and the United States at the moment, and Russia. I mean, w what you've observed in your lifetime is that we all thought they were coming together, and now they've probably been as far apart as they've ever been. Um, but on something like that, you would expect there to be an international response. Is there a Western international response distinct from China? Um, or is everybody 
seeking to find some sort of universal agreement as to the applications in the future? I think at the moment, um, I would say that the effort to, uh, to, to um, that there's more effort to find agreement than there is um, disagreement. Certainly, if you think about the people, uh, there are active attempts between um, you know the European Union, China, the US, um, and um, sort of the other um, smaller players, including uh, you know Australia and us, and uh, you know. Uh, uh, Japan and others, right? So there's, there, there, there is a lot of um, joint work at the moment in trying to find ways forward uh, for using AI in good ways. You know, whether um, those ro those roads certainly tend to be bumpy, um, but again, I think that um, New Zealand in particular um, has a small but important role to play in trying to keep those conversations sort of together and um, as international as possible. Well, I mean, one of the ways... You know, if we start competing, you know, if we start fighting over AI, that, that, that has a good chance of not ending well. Well, but one of the ways immediately I think of the application of AI is in a destructive context, Michael, and that is in terms of arming military systems. Um, it would almost seem inevitable that it will be used for that purpose. But, it, you know, it could make them safer or it could make them more dangerous, right? It is almost... In, um, we, you know, we, the military capabilities that humans have are already quite dangerous enough, right? Um, it, you know, it would be difficult to make them significantly more dangerous. Than they are at the moment. Um, All right, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, um, you know we, we have enormously destructive weapons at our disposal, right? Um, so... Now the question is whether or not the way they can, um, whether we can find ways of decreasing the likelihood that they're used, right? And when they are used, decreasing the amount of damage that they do, right? And in that in that case, um, it's not entirely clear what role AI might or should have. All right. Um, now your field of research in this area. Um Gosh, you must be. I oh, know you won't be. You're not close to retirement yet. No, you're not. So, where um, where are I, you I going? No, I have no plans to retire. No, good on you. Where are um, you yeah, going so, on this yeah. um, in terms of policy and research right. in the future? Yeah. So in in um, in AI, what we work on at a technical level is having these systems be better at sort of careful, deliberate thinking. Right, so um, the sort of thinking that we do when we analyse, say, a scientific paper or a collection of scientific papers, or the sort of thinking that we do when we decide um, what the competing interests are in, say, a legal um, uh, or financial dis dispute, right? So those sorts of um, those sorts of uh, thinking that would be quite it would be quite good if we could do more of them, uh, more careful thinking. Right, so so at a technical level, we um, work on that at a kind of um, societal level. Um, so actually, about ooh, 15 years ago, I wrote a white paper. Uh, actually, when I was here in DC, um, on something called Project Houston, and the idea with that was providing everybody a sort of um, companion that you could say, you know, Houston, uh, we have a problem, just like the. Um, Apollo astronauts did, right? And it would try to work out how to stop things from going wrong for you. At a societal level, I would like to see something like that made possible in New Zealand, right? So that if, if things seem to be going sideways for you, you've got you know, something that is really paying attention to making things better, um, to sorting out the problem by solving uh, what's going wrong. I think that that is something that can be implemented now using current technology, something that you can talk to, that it will understand what the kind of um, social um, and financial and other tools that are available are and help you to navigate them to, um, to solve the sorts of pickles that all of us get into from time to time. What so the kind of yeah. um, social impact, that's the kind of research that I... 
uh, would like to concentrate on. That, that'd be fascinating. So uh, whether I'm suicidal on one hand or I've been ditched by my girlfriend on the other or I've lost my job, I can come to a central source and say, you've got any solutions? Exactly, and that will, it will stay with you until that problem's solved and it'll bring in you know, whatever it needs to bring in to help you solve that problem and it'll you know, have a conversation with you to find out what the situation is. I think that that is... Um, that's buildable now, and it you know hasn't been buildable in the past. That is no, not you know it's not solved. Like we can't just do it. But this is within you know this is within reach. You know it's within the you know the, the five year time frame that uh, was the sort of headline on that uh, stuff piece. That yeah. is well, that's fantastic, Michael. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, how long are you staying in the states for? When are you coming back? Uh, coming back in a couple of weeks. Okay. Well, enjoy yourself. Um, and thank you very much for taking your time to talk to us about that. Um, I tell you, tell you I, I think this is so exciting on one hand, but by gosh, so dis socially disruptive. I, it would be as disruptive as, as almost the spinning jenny, wouldn't it, in terms of society? I, I think so. And if you think that this is interesting in terms of its disruption, uh, another time I can talk to you about brain-computer interfaces. We will talk about that when you get back. You have a really good time in the US. Thank you so yeah. much for joining us today, mate. Thank you, Michael. Okay, see, see you, mate. Um, it's Professor Michael Whitbrock, Auckland University.